Church is a great place to grow your faith. If it is your first time here, whether online or in person, we would love to get to know you. In You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill up the same old holes inside, there's a better
right. Good morning, church family. It's great to be with all of you this morning. Man, the great thing is we are in one accord when we come for the purpose of one name. The name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, who saved us and gave us a way to be in relationship, a right relationship with our Father who desired that for us. And this morning, I'm not sure if anyone here is knows, but it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, taking time to show our appreciation and our value for those in spiritual leadership of us. And I'm going to read real quick just a verse from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. This says this, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. And I thought about this verse. And I thought to myself, how good have I been this year so far being a blessing to the people in leadership, to my pastor, and to her family, rather than a burden. God, we have our own relationship with God, and he desires us in his spirit to move us to a place of maturity. And so many times we want to we want to depend, we want that dependability to be on spiritual leadership when God's just saying, no, come meet with me. But they're there for you too. Meet with the Savior, meet with Jesus Christ. And I have put these people in place to help guide you and direct you, but not to have the relationship for you. And so that is so important. Those of you online with us and here in person with us, God desires a personal relationship with each of us. And so many times we use that crutch. We overuse that crutch on our spiritual leaders. When God's just saying, no, I'm at the table. <laughs> meet with me. I'm here. I want to meet with you. And so this morning, if I can have Pastor Renee and, and Mark join me down here. Um, we just wanted as a church to just um, extend our gratitude and our appreciation and our thankfulness for the two of you and uh, just the humility that you guys show. Um, I talked a little bit uh, in our youth group about humility and how true leadership starts with a, a foundation of humility, considering others rather than yourself and a heart of service. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do because remember it's in our nature to just think of ourselves and it's, it's really hard um, and it is really spirit led when people can live such a selfless life. And I've known this family for a long time. And so, um, <laughs> hey, that means I'm getting old too. Um, I know I remember, oh man, won't even go there. Um, we got stories. Yeah, we do. But I just wanted to take this time and on behalf of our church family, we just wanted to just extend our appreciation to the two of you for the countless years of service that you continue to have uh, to the work and the ministry of God and of heaven. Um, to focus on things that are above and not below and to really help guide us in this journey and to help us all understand that God didn't intend for us to live this journey alone. And sometimes we hear those words and we're like, yes, thank you, Pastor. I'm going to come right alongside you. But, but how many of us come alongside them to to make sure they're not gone. And so just think of those things. And uh, we just wanted to, I just want to pray for you guys and pray for your family as we continue, before we continue in worship. But uh, can we just, and, and if you have uh, clap emojis, can we just get a round of applause for our pastor and their family and everything that they do? Amen. Let's pray for them. Join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I just I just thank you so much, Father God, for the for the leaders that you place in authority in our lives, spiritual leaders. People who who put the footprints in the sand where we can follow and be guided. But also, Lord, where there could be great fellowship. Because the fellowship is because we have the same spirit in us 
who is in unison. It's not in dissension when the, the spirit doesn't fight with the spirit. It's in fellowship with each other, with, with, with that. And so, Lord, I just lift up Pastor Renee and her family and Mark to you, Lord. I just pray, God, where, where they need comfort, where they need love, where they need peace, where they need understanding, where they need guidance. I just pray that you will just guide and direct that and fill that, fill those needs in their lives, Lord. And that, God, you will use this church family, these sheep that you have brought to this fellowship here at Access to just be a blessing to them. Not just, not just once a year when Pastor Appreciation Month comes around, but, Lord, on a daily, weekly, moment-by-moment -moment basis, may we truly show our appreciation and be a blessing to our pastor and and her family for the service and for the dedication for the selfless hearts that they continue to have in ministry. Lord, I thank you for the vision that you have placed in Pastor Renee's heart and in her life. And I just pray that she continues to be um, that leader that just continues to live by conviction and not condemnation. That you continue to, to just make her heart so contrite towards you. And that, God, I thank you for Mark and coming alongside and truly being active alongside this journey that, that you have called the two of them to. I thank you, God, for what, you will, that what you've done in their lives and in their ministry. And I pray that for what you're going to continue to do in their lives and in their ministry ahead. Lord, help us all to just get out of the way and join alongside them in this journey to what you have in store for Access Church in this community and with each other and in this world. Lord, we love you and we just give you honor and praise and we lay Pastor Renee and Mark and their family at your feet. And we just pray, God, your head of protection upon them. May you continue to be their provider, their, their healer, their, their redemption story, Lord. We give you honor and praise and, and may we just continue in this worship service to worship you in spirit and truth. And may we take a moment to just thank you, God, for everything that you have provided us with. Forgive us, Lord, for overlooking the, the simple things in life that we take so much for granted. Now, Lord, inhabit the praises of your people as we continue to worship you and all. In spirit and in truth, we thank you. We thank you for, for Pastor Renee and Mark and their family. And we thank you for what you're going to do in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a time in our service where you and I can experience God's power through song and offering. Offerings come in many forms from our ties to our praise and God honors our submission to his call. Let's worship. Will you stand with me?
how high would I climb the mountains if the mountains were where you are? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lonely seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you're neither I would search and stop at nothing, but you're just not that hard to find. Oh, I will praise you on the mountain, and I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're
was on. Let's not mic it. Good morning and welcome. Hey, you guys came out in the rain and you lived. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Welcome online as well. I I mentioned it's nice and cozy by your fires, right? I just want to say good morning and do a welcome. Uh, Pastor Kevin Portillo from Faith Community in just a few moments is going to come up and bring us a word, but I wanted to make a connection with you this morning because that's why we gather. So I don't know about you, but in the worship, Maybe you're somebody that's not into worship, you're not into necessarily music, but I pray that during those times you're at least listening to the lyrics, you are reading the lyrics when they're coming up on the screen, and and really letting those words, and so as I was sitting there with that last song, and I, I don't remember lyrics like these guys do, so I would have to have them in front of me, but... There's a, at the very beginning, and you might want to help me here, uh, Diana, that there's, um, that says, I would climb the mountain kind of if I knew you were up there. I'd go through the valley if I knew you were on the other side. It's something to that effect, right? Um, oh, how, oh, how high would I climb, right, if the mountains were where you were hiding? What's the next one? Go to that next one. Um, I'd scale the valleys if you grace it. Leave that right there. I was I'm sitting there, I'm just, because, you know, I just, I'm such a visual person in Christ. You know, uh, how far would we go? And thinking about how far would I trek through this valley if I knew on the other side he was going to be there, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you. Maybe this has never happened to you, but I go through valleys. I get it. You you know, it's very unusual. And so, but you might find yourself in a valley right now as you're going through. But I was thinking about that. So there's this book that I read to my grandkids. I actually read it to my children when they were little and they loved it. And so now I have to read it to my grandkids. And it says, there's a monster at the end of this book. How many of you know that book? It's a great book. If you ever want me to read it, I'll do it for a sermon on Sunday because the kids love it because they get very animated, very unlike me. And so I read the, if there's, oh my gosh, there's a monster at the end of the book. And the whole idea is that Grover, the cookie monster, is telling you not to turn the pages because he hears there's a monster at the end of the book. And so every page, he does this animated thing where he's like, please don't turn the page. Whatever you do, don't turn the page because I hear there's a monster at the end of the book, right? And so he goes through this whole thing and then you get it, right? 
It gets to the end, and of course, Grover says, well, it's just me, fuzzy little Grover. I'm the monster at the end of the book, right? So I'm thinking about that as I'm thinking of this, because the reality is we may be going through a valley, and oftentimes we feel like we're going through the valleys alone, right? We're trying to walk through, because on the other side, we're going to see Jesus. But really, Psalm 23 says that all along, he was there the whole time, much like the monster was with them the whole time through the book. Right? I was totally making that connection. So I'm like, man, sometimes we think I have to get through this so that I can find Jesus. And when you get there, you go, wait a second. You've been with me the whole time. Jesus is with you in your valley this morning, wherever that is. Jesus is on the mountain with you. Jesus is in the climb to the mountain, right? He is with you wherever you are. And that's so encouraging. So let, and, and, and how do we experience him? How do we experience Jesus in the valley? We experience him through the body of Christ. It's one of the reasons that we want to connect with you. Because sometimes we just, we need, I was talking to somebody this morning about somebody listening to being prayed for. Because sometimes when you're in the valley, you don't even know how to pray, right? You're just desperate. But then the body of Christ comes along and says, we'll pray for you. And we're going to pray with you. And then it just carries you. And the whole time you realize, wait a second, you have been Christ all along. That's what the body of Christ meets for. That's what the community of faith is designed for. It's not just designed for this one hour and a half, right? It's not just for this one moment, but it's so much more. And so we want to connect. If you're online, we want to connect with you. If you're in person, we want to connect. And so you got a bulletin when you came in, rip that out, write on there your name, Write on a prayer request, do something so that we can make a connection with you, so that we can be that Jesus that walks through the valley. Because at some point, I need you to be that Jesus for me. Amen, right? Sometimes we just, we switch roles. I'm going to get through that valley and then next, right? Next time you're going to go through a valley and I'm going to walk with you and be Jesus for you and you're going to be Jesus for me. And that's the community of faith and that's what we desire to do here at Axis. So when we ask you to fill those out, that's what we want to do. We want to journey through the valleys and the highlands all the same with you. So be sure to do that. So I'm going to ask Pastor Kevin. He's going to come up and talk about the word becoming flesh. Can you hear me? Check. Am I on? Kind of? Yes. Nice. My name is Kevin, for you, those of you who don't know, um, I, you guys have a great pastor. <laughs> I just want to just highlight uh, the Pastor Appreciation um, Month, and Renee is one of the best pastors I've ever seen, and that is no joke. And she is awesome and wonderful. You have a great pastor. And so, yes. And uh, like a great pastor, she's like, hey, preach whatever you want today. <laughs> and I, I both love and I hate that. Because I'm like, what in the world do I want to say? And so you're thinking about like, okay, what can I, what can I go through? What questions do I want to ask? And so this is what I landed on. And so maybe this resonates with you. But I landed on this, because this is what, the way my mind works, is why does everything exist? What is the purpose of life? What is the meaning of life? What is my calling? What is my purpose? Where are we? Who am I? Why is everything so wrong with the world? And how do we fix this mess? Is that just me asking those kinds of questions? Or is that kind of like everybody? Like, what is the meaning of life? Let me just sit with that for a second. What is, what is the purpose? <clears throat> everybody, regardless if you're a Christian or a believer or religious or whatever have you, you ask these four questions. You ask, where am I? Who am I? What's gone wrong? And what's the solution? Where am I? What is this place? I'm not saying like, where are you? Like you're in a building or anything like that, but like, where are you? Planet Earth. Like, what is this? This universe. You see galaxies and stars and planets and you're like, where are we? What is this, this reality? Where are we? And different people answer that differently, you know? Everybody can have come to different answers. Where are, where are we? And sometimes we don't know. We have lost the meaning of the purpose of this universe. We have lost the meaning of everything. Why does everything exist? I don't know. I'm just trying to live my life. 
Or take the next question, who are you? Who am I? Wow, if there's, a, if there's a question that all of us are struggling with in today's world, it's that question. Who am I? We're all trying to find our identities somewhere. We're all trying to place our identity somewhere. I, I think I, I'm this. I think I'm the, the people um, I hang around with. I think I'm the possessions that I have. I think I'm, I, the, I am the things that I do. I, I think I'm what people say about me. Whatever you say about me, that's who I am. Who are you? Who am I? What's my purpose? What's my calling? And some of us are like, I don't know who I am. I'm just here. I'm just Kevin Portillo. And I'm like, I'm pretty average. <laughs> I, who are I? Who am I? What's gone wrong with this world? You don't have to be a Christian to know that something's wrong with this place. You just have to look outside. I mean, just look within your own family. Man, there's so much wrong with your family. Jeez. If you look at my family, you're like, oh my gosh, how are you a pastor? <laughs> What's gone wrong with this place? So much violence. So much hatred. So much evil. So much deceit, disgust. What's wrong with this place? And then what's the solution? How do we fix this? There has to be some way to fix this. What is it? And so we give our lives to politicians who pass laws. Like, here's how we fix the world. Do this, vote for this bill. Do this, vote for this person. And do this, vote for our leaders, support our leaders. Because we're going to make this world a whole lot better. Or you have your own ways of fixing it. Or probably you just don't care. Like, I don't care. I'm just going to live my life. And so I'm thinking about these questions. I'm like, how as Christians do we answer to that? How do we respond to that? And I think there's one chapter in the whole Bible that answers this question, and it's John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, this is where we'll be for the, the rest of this message. It's John chapter 1. I am completely biased on John. I think it's the best gospel. You can argue with me till Jesus comes back. I think it's the best book in the entire Bible. So uh, we'll see who's right at the end of time. <laughs> but I think John is one of the best books of the Bible, hands down. And this first chapter, I think, just sums up and answers all these questions, all the questions of the human condition in just this one verse or this one chapter. And so we're going to look at the first 18 verses. We'll break it down. But for now, I want to read the first five verses. It's this. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In the beginning, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of all this universe, John says there was this thing called the Word. What is this Word? John is kind of echoing what happens in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, the very first word is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the verse 3 says, and then God said... Let there be light. And the whole chapter of Genesis is God speaking things into his existence. He just says the word. Hey, chair, be a chair. And poof, there's a chair. <laughs> hey, planet Earth, be. And poof, planet Earth comes. Light, the sun, the moon, the stars. God just speaks the word, just says something. And his word is like not like your words that just... You know, you don't really mean your words. You don't intend to say those things. But God, every word that comes out of God's mouth is intentional, has purpose, and has meaning. And has so much meaning that it, has, it brings forth life and light and creation. Things spring forth. Vegetation arises when God just speaks. God just says a word and things come into being. And so John is saying, in the beginning there was this word. And this word was God, and this word was with God. Throughout the entire Old Testament, this word 
this weird thing called the word shows up everywhere. Like in Psalm 33, 6, it says this, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. God's word is tied to making things come alive, creating things, bringing forth life. Another place is in Psalm 107, 19 through 20, when they cried to the Lord in their trouble, he saved them from their distress and he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. God's word is also tied to healing and salvation. Not only though when God speaks, things come to be, but when God speaks, things are healed. When God speaks, things are saved. Things are made right. And God's word also has purpose. A, a really great uh, verse that us preachers love to use is Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, there until they water the earth, making it bring forth uh, life and sprouts, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word has purpose. God's word has a mission. God's word is sent out from his mouth and it's meant to do, bring something back to God, the speaker. So God's word is tied to creation. God's word is tied to healing and salvation. And God's word is tied to purpose. And this is what we find in John. In the beginning was the word, and in him all things came to be. And there was light. There was purpose. But in John, does the word of God heal and save? Well, this is where things are about to get mind-blowingly awesome. <laughs> Your mind is about to explode in just 10 seconds. So prepare yourself be ready. Something is about to go down. You ready for this? This is not my word. This is the word of the Lord. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh. Amen. <laughs> if you're not like aghast and kind of in awe, like sitting at the back of your chair, like you're, you're, you just didn't get that. Let me say it again. Ready? <laughs> the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of us as a, as a father's only son, full of grace and truth. What is this word become flesh? What are we saying? What do Christians believe when we say that this word that made everything, that this word by uh, to which all things owe their existence, this word of God became flesh. What are we talking about here? We're talking about this mind-blowing belief, confession, and doctrine that God became a human being. That God Almighty, the creator and author of all life, became what he made. That the God the creator became the created. That God who is all-knowing, everywhere at the same time, full of glory and majesty, became a piece of meat. <laughs> and he can only be in one space, one spot at a time. Because if you're here, you can't be at Costco at the same time. And so Jesus who is the word, was here, he could only be at one place at one time. If he was feeding people, he couldn't be over there. But he is the word. He's God himself. 1 John 1 says it this way, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked and touched at with our hands. Concerning this word of life. John is saying, we have touched this word. We have, we have smelled this word. 
We have encountered it skin by skin, eyes to eyes. We have seen this word become flesh. He lived among us. He moved around with us. I want to teach you a big word in, uh, in Christian theology. Uh, ready? You're going, to say it. You're going to say it once I say it. The word is incarnation. Ready? We're going to, we're going to say that all at once. Ready? One, two, three. Incarnation. One more time. I want to get it deep within your bones. Here we go. One, two, three. Incarnation. Not reincarnation. Take out the re. That's another belief system out there. Um, we'll talk about that another time. But incarnation is just this. The word became flesh. The word became human. God became Jesus Christ. God is Jesus Christ in the flesh. Do you, do you understand what this means for us? This is just mind-boggling stuff. No other religion, no other faith in the world believes this. That God will become one Palestinian Jew of a man. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is, what, what does that even look like? When he was born from the Virgin Mary, was he like just perfect? He didn't cry. <laughs> Did he ever poop? Did he ever pee? Did he have to like have bowel movements like us humans do? Did he eat? Was he thirsty? Was he tired? Did he cry? Did he suffer? Was he ever in pain? To be human is to be all these things, right? It's to be limited. It's to be. It's to be like I need a bar, I need a burrito right now because otherwise I'm gonna like be mad at you. It's to be thirsty. It's to drink stuff like this. It's to talk and engage with people. It's to use the bathroom. It's to feel pain and emotion and grief and emotion and grief and sorrow and doubt and confusion and cry out, God, where are you? <laughs> and then one day, and yes, this is true for all of us, uh, we are going to die. To be human is to face that inevitability that all of us are going to die. You're not going to get out of here by dying. I'm sorry. <laughs> Woo, the word of the Lord, so uplifting. <laughs> but Jesus died. God experienced death like a human being. The word became flesh. So whatever you feel, Whatever emotion you're feeling, whatever darkness you may be experiencing, whatever suffering and pain you have and doubts and questions, God himself knows exactly what that feels like. God, and through Jesus, knows what it feels like to be a human being. The Christian God is not a God that's so like sophisticated and pompous and just out there in heaven. It's like, you, you plebeians, you mere mortals down there, you have no idea what you're doing. I can't believe why you're doing that. The Christian God says, no, Jesus empathizes with our weaknesses. He knows our temptations, and he suffers along with us. That is the Christian God. That is what's so mind-boggling. No other faith has that. But this is the real truth. This is true. Why would God do that? Why would God become human like you and I? Well, this is a re another reason why John's the best gospel, because John 3.16. This is the most famous verse out there in the planet. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Why did God become flesh? Because he loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem you. God became what 
he love? You. You limited human mere mortal. You with flesh and bones and skin and you kind of smell sometimes. God became like you. A human being with flesh and bones. God became what he loved. God became what he wanted to save. God became what he wanted to heal. God became what he wanted to restore. God became what he wanted to be in relationship with. Human beings. <laughs> this is huge. What's the consequence of this uh, truth and reality? What, 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 make, what changes that God became flesh? What in the world changes? Well, in the first chapter of John, it continues in 10 through 13. The word was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Because the Son of God became like you, he now has the authority and the power to make you Fully authentic, bona fide children of God. You are reborn spiritually as children of the living God. You are a son and a daughter of the king. You are now made new. To believe in Jesus is to be reborn. To believe in Jesus is to believe that I am not the same as I used to be. To believe in Jesus is to be adopted as a son and daughter of this God. I am made whole because of the word made flesh. Now to go back to our questions. You see, John already answered all our questions. Where am I? Well, everything you look at was made by the word. Everything that you see, the heavens, the birds, the trees, that shrub out there was made by the word. It was brought into existence by the word of God. Where are we? We're in God's beautiful creation made by the word. Who am I? You are a child of the beloved God. You are beloved so much that God became like you in order to redeem you. You are worth dying for. You are worth God limiting himself. You are worth God becoming human. What's gone wrong? Well, everywhere you look is rejecting the word. Every, everywhere you look is just anti-Jesus everywhere. The whole world is rejecting Jesus. We're not living by his standards. We're not living like he wants us to live. We're not living as if that were true. That's what's wrong. Sin, evil, death, and hell. But what's the solution? How did God save us? The Word became flesh. That is how God saves us. That is God's plan of how to restore this whole mess. That is God's way of dealing with us. I'm, be I'm going to become like you. I'm going to live among you. I'm going to act like you. I'm going to teach you what it means to be really human. I'm going to teach you what it means to follow after me. I'm going to teach you all the things that you need to know about life, light, creation. Your whole purpose is right here in God. Your whole calling is right here. And even it answers what's our calling and our mission. There's these three verses in the first chapter of John. It talks about John the Baptist. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Be like John the Baptist. Live into the calling he had. What was his calling? 
It was simply this. He pointed to Jesus. It says, there was a man who sent from God, he came as a witness. A witness is just someone who points. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Hey, let me, have you heard of a guy named Jesus? John was not the light. He didn't take credit for it. He wasn't saying like, oh, hey, I'm the gospel. I'm going to save you. Guess what? I'm, I'm all that. He's like, no. He pointed to Jesus. He's so like modest that whenever we talk about the gospel, we forget about John the Baptist. We're like, who is that guy? I have no idea who he was. That's the point. He came as a forerunner before Jesus. He prepared the way. He's like, I don't care if you remember my name in the history books. All I care about is lifting the name of Jesus. That is your calling, and that is my calling. To point to Jesus in every single thing that we do. To point to the Word made flesh. Everything that you are should reflect that Word become flesh movement. From heaven to earth movement. From, from status to, to low status. From glory to just normalcy. You see, God, who is rich, became poor. Are you becoming poor, poorer and poorer, so that others can be rich in God? You see, God humbled himself. He was all that. But he, he humbled himself to a human being. Are you, are we that are all that, humbling ourselves before others? He had all on our reputation and status for the sake of others. Or do we want all the glory to ourselves? Or do we want all the attention to be about me? You see, as Christians, this is what we believe. This is the God we worship. This is the God we choose to follow and obey. It's a God who humbled himself, who laid down his crown, who laid down his glory, who became poor like you, so that we can become rich. You see, church, this is, this is the calling of the church, friends. The church is not called to be full of glorious people who are just great and high status and just all of that in a bag of chips and just wants the world to themselves and just loves how amazing they are and just like revels in that fact. No, the church is called to be a servant to the world. The church is called... To go to the unlovables, to the untouchables, because that's what God did when he became human. He cried with those who needed to be cried with. He greed with those. He counseled those. He hung out with adulterous women. How dare he? He hung out with sinners. How dare he? drunkards and tax collectors and things like that. None of us are in this room like that, right? Are we following the word become flesh? For those of you who are identify yourselves as a Christians, as Christians, you have received Jesus, you have believed Jesus, you confess it, you believe that the, the word became flesh. I know, I've seen you guys. You guys sing about it all the time. You believe everything that Jesus is. You take Jesus at his word. You stake your whole life on him. I'm all in. I, I bet my whole life that this is true. Now that you know Jesus, your calling like John the Baptist, like your mission statement says, is to make Jesus known. In everything that you do. You know Jesus, but now it's time to make him known. Tell people how God became what he loved. Tell people how God became like you, a human being. Tell people that Jesus is the word made flesh. Tell people that Jesus is the answer to their questions of who am I? What's my identity? 
Tell, Jesus, tell people that Jesus is the answer to their questions of where are we? What's the meaning and purpose of this whole universe? Jesus is the answer to every single problem. Jesus is God's answer to sin, to death, to hell, to everything. It's the token Sunday school answer. Jesus. But it's so true. It is so true. At the end of your life, how do you want to be known? When people come to your funeral, I, I imagine at John the Baptist's funeral, I imagine they were saying, you know, his whole entire life, he just pointed to Jesus every single moment of his days. I hope at my funeral, that's the first thing people say about me. He pointed to Jesus in every aspect. And I hope it's the last thing they say about me. Is that the last thing they want, you want people to say about you? She pointed to Jesus in everything that she did. I hope it is. And you can start living that today with the help of this weird bunch of folk called Access Church. We're all weird in here. I'm weird. I'm the strangest of them all. But we're all in this together. Believe in Jesus. Follow Jesus. And one day, one day, at the end of all this universe, at the end of time, when God reconciles all things, makes things brand new, and there won't be any pain, nor death, nor suffering, nor sin, nor hell, nor death, nor anything like that at all. But a new heaven and a new earth. One day, you will get to see the Word made flesh face to face. You will get to touch skin to skin. The Word become flesh. You will be able to speak with Him. Go out to coffee with Him. What a glorious day that will be when we all encounter the Word become the flesh. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, your word is powerful. Your word is transformative. Your word heals. Your word saves God. And that same word became Jesus Christ. And we worship at his feet. We give our lives to him. We exalt him. We submit to him. We just raise his glory up, Lord. Not to us, but to the word of become flesh be all the glory. Father, I pray, Lord, that we may just be in awe and wonder at that marvelous mystery of how you took our skin upon your life. Help us to worship you better. Help us to lift you up. Help us to be in awe of you, God. This is not just some mere fact or truth that we can just say without you being unchanged by God. It changes everything. So help us, Lord, to receive that. Help us to point to your son in every aspect that we do. From the words that we say, to the feelings that we feel, to the thoughts that we have, to the actions we do. God, I pray, Lord, that everyone in this room may be healed by your word. Wherever they are at, whatever valleys they may be in, whatever pain they may be feeling, whatever questions, whatever things they may be going through, God, I pray, Lord, that you just speak the word and to begin that healing process, God. Father, I ask in the name of your Son that all of us, that this church may become a Jesus church and continue to be a Jesus church. Help the world know Jesus better through this congregation. And it is through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that I pray. Amen. Amen.